All right. So, um, also before we get into this, so for today's lab, um, I looked at today's lab that's scheduled and I want to make a few changes to it that should have um, a good effect on our yield and make our, give us better results. Uh, and I also wanted to give us a time, a uh, enough time to go to that climate change talk happening at Duke Theater at three. Um, so since that's directly in our lab time today, we'll do a sort of a paper homework assignment, just, just mechanism and reaction practice, give everybody a chance to get caught up on those, feeling good about those. Um, and then um, just, uh, we'll just walk over to, um, I think it's at Duke Theater. So there should be plenty of room for us, even if you haven't RSVP'd. Um, and we'll go, we'll go see that climate change talk at three. Um, so I'll have an assignment for you. I'll post it online. You don't need to show up to lab at one. So you can just, you know, go do your own thing till three. Um, if you want a printed copy of the assignment, just swing by lab or, or my office and I'll print some out. Um, but that's what we'll do for, for lab this week. And then next week we'll do the, in addition, re hydration reaction of, uh, of an alkene. Um, we, the, the plan was to do addition reaction of, or acid catalyzed addition for, um, cyclohexene. So, why don't start by just doing a quick review, what would, what does cyclohexene look like and what would you expect for the acid catalyzed hydration product? So we can't let my kids have nice things. Cyclohexene. Doing acid catalyzed hydration. We would expect to make cyclohexanol, right? No stereochemistry involved because there's no there's no cis or trans, there's no other substituents on the cyclohexene. So we don't even need to worry about Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. Um, in theory, this reaction works really well for a, for a lab because it's pretty easy. Um, cyclohexene is really cheap. You just need an acid basically to do this. The problem is, is if you look at the literature, Cyclohexanol is a solid just above room temperature as its melting point. Um, in theory, what we've seen when we do this reaction in lab is that we get decent yields, but we can't we can't be sure what we make is actually cyclohexanol or that we don't have a whole bunch of leftover reactants um, because we don't see a really clear melting point. Even putting it on ice, we can't get the cyclohexanol to form nice crystals. It kind of just turns into a gelatinous mess, um, which is really hard to measure a melting point for as well. Um, so considering I originally wrote this procedure to be to replace a more expensive uh, molecule called norbornene. Um, norbornene, make sure I don't, I think it's, two carbons. Either way, I'm, I'm going to go from memory here. It's one of those bicyclic structures. It's basically cyclohexene. Um, with a, another bridged bicyclic structure. So you have two hexagons sort of stacked on top of each other. So something that Exactly. I believe the double bond is there on one of, I'm trying to do it in a way that's not going to make it really hard to tell what I'm trying to draw from broad on that one. Double bond is on one of those groups. Um, when you turn that into Norborn, Norbornol, the alcohol version, by hydrating it, um, you get something that is definitely solid, a lot low, at a lot higher temperatures, a lot cleaner to get that melting point. 
Um, the downside is that norbornene smells pretty bad and just hangs around for a while. I think I don't I don't smell it, so I don't know if it's just Mariola's got a little PTSD from workshopping this lab. <laughs> Um, but she says she can still smell it from when she and Cody spilled it on the ground last last summer when they were working on some of these procedures. Um, so we're going to do our best to only work with it in the fume hood and try not to spill it so that we don't cause that problem in the future. Um, but either way, that's kind of part of dealing with uh, OCAM is sometimes some of the stuff smells less than pleasant. We'll try to avoid sulfur-based compounds for that reason as well. Sulfur-based compounds smell really bad. Um, Isn't brain structures that contribute to like how we perceive the smell? Absolutely. So, so what smell and taste really are doing is it's basically if a certain molecule has the right shape to fit into the receptor site, then it triggers an electrical response and that's, that matches up with, with neurons in your brain to say, hey, you smell this. So that's why certain things that have similar molecular structures tend to taste and smell similar as well to a certain extent. Um, for instance, vanillin and benzaldehyde only differ by one methoxy group, which is why almond flavoring, benzaldehyde is, is the flavor of almond flavoring. Almond extract is almost 100% benzaldehyde. Um, and that's why almond and vanilla have really kind of similar flavor profiles, when, especially if you're baking with them. You know, you could you could make a substitution and it's not going to taste the same, but, you know, it's going to be close enough that it could, it'll still taste pretty good. Um, and that's and so the word aromatic is a little bit of a misnomer in organic chemistry because aromatic means an aromatic rings to us. And aromatic to the general populace means something very fragrant. So limonene is not aromatic in the chemical sense, but it's very much an aromatic in the cooking and popular, you know, popular use of the word aromatic, very fragrant. Um, so, and that's part of what um, sulfur compounds all have similar smells. They all smell pretty bad, um, but some of them are worse than others. Um, and sometimes it's because it, if you happen to get the right structure that hits those taste, those smell receptors more effectively, that binds those more effectively, then you get, you trigger a response at a lower threshold. Um, so like a lot of artificial sweeteners still have calories in them, but because they trigger the sweet response on your taste receptors at a three, at 300 times more effectively than sugar does, you can use 300 times less aspartame. Um, then you would use sugar to get the same flavor ish. Um, so, uh, where else was we going to go with it? Oh, Rigney was telling me about um, a time when he was working in a lab and they synthesized a, um, a specific sulfur compound that resulted in the entire floor being um, evacuated. It smelled so bad that they actually had to evacuate the entire building um, because there are some of those that trigger like really, really violent physiological responses just because it's a survival mechanism. Um, as far as quiz questions, uh, we'll go through these. EN is the shorthand for the enantiomer. If we make something with, with more than one stereo center, we can't just say R plus S because we have to be specific. It's not all four stereoisomers. And it's not just that one of our stereo centers flip. If we want to say plus the enantiomer, we just say plus EN. Um, and was that the textbook? Or I did that on the board, I think, right? In some of the like mechanisms. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, and can you modify acid catalyzed ring opening process in a way which add other functional groups than just an alcohol? Absolutely. Where did, let's see. So here's an example. If you have an epoxide, any strong nucleophile can be used to do a ring opening reaction. Um, some of which are very similar to what we've already seen. So we can add, make an ether out of it, right? Doing that. Um, we can add a cyanogroup. 
We use cyanide as a nucleophile. Anything sulfur based, all of those sulfur based analogs of the oxygen functional groups, most of those were strong nucleophiles. Um, and we can, if we have a hydride source, we can actually use a hydride as a nucleophile and just wind up hydrogenating the other side too. This is one we haven't seen yet. That's really, really valuable though. Um, so I'll take a second and talk about this reaction here because this is basically gonna be, if we need to add carbons, we're trying to do a synthesis problem and we wanna add carbons to something. Um, we don't really have another way of doing that. We can add an ether, but that's really adding an oxygen, right? Um, so this mechanism is called the Grignard, or Grignard mechanism. Um, and the, the, let me, I'll spell that. Um, I believe it's Italian. So it's got the GN like lasagna to make an NEA. But I believe he was actually Swiss. The Grignard mechanism is basically a way to make an organo uh, metallic compound with magnesium bromide. And what that does is when you have a carbon attached to the magnesium, the carbon's more electronegative than the magnesium, so it actually gives the carbon a negative charge, partial negative charge, which makes the carbon a nucleophile. So this is going to be our way that we can add carbons to things, is, is you're going to see it. So first, you have a, a um, an alkyl bromide, and you put it with magnesium bromide. When you do that, it'll, I believe it's alkyl bromide that'll do that. I'll, I don't remember which chapter it is that it first, we first present this, uh, but I want to show it to you so you're familiar with it a little bit. Um, basically, what you're going to get is the magnesium kind of puts itself in between your R group and the bromide. And so you get this magnesium bromide compound um, that's called a Grignard reagent. And we'll actually do a lab where we make a Grignard reagent, and then um, we'll actually be able to use that the following week to do a synthesis. Um, it's kind of tricky though, because they're very, very sensitive to water. If you allow Grignard reagent to get exposed to water at all, it'll turn into an alcohol and magnesium oxide um, almost immediately. And it's very exothermic when it does that, so you can actually wind up with a catching fire if you expose it to water. So you have to be really careful with these. And that's one of the reasons why we, um, typically if, you are, if we're actually in a synthetic lab or if we're more in an upper division class, we would have to do basically two labs back to back. You don't get a chance to take a week for a break after you make your Grignard reagent, you use it right away. Um, because if you don't, it's going to go bad on a shelf because it's almost impossible to keep all of the moisture out um, in a way that doesn't cause it to also catch fire. Um, so that's what this is showing. I don't think any of the problems in the near future have a Grignard reagent as, the, um, as one of the, the reactants. But if you see that, the net result of that is your R group is a nucleophile wherever that, that magnesium is attached. So you can do things like add an isopropyl group if you have an epoxide. Um, you can use it just as a straight up SN2 nucleophile, but it's not great for that because that carbon's not a, that strong of a nucleophile. So depending on what your leaving group is, it, you might not get great yield. So typically we do something more like this where we have a less stable reactant. Um, makes it a little bit easier to get your product that way. Um, if we have a real unknown, like say our, our essential oils from the end of last quarter's lab, how do we know if it's actually a mixture versus is it a pure substance? Um, you can get some evidence for that on a mass spec, but not necessarily. Your best guess for figuring out if you actually have a mixture is going to be GC. 
um, or if it's something that won't if, um, that won't uh, is not very volatile, you can use a high pressure liquid chromatography. But for stuff that you're pretty sure is all organic, gas chromatographs are going to be your go-to figure out if it's a mixture. Um, you know, and those are some of the ones that they have been automated so that you you take a GC and when a peak comes out of the GC it automatically you get a mass spec taken of it um, or automatically get an IR of it. Um, they don't I don't think they really have a GC NMR yet because NMR requires your sample be put into a solution with specific solvents. So I don't think that you can do a GC NMR yet. But GC IR and GC um, mass spec GCMS are really, really common tools so that you can say, okay, not only do I have this mix, do I know it's a mixture, I know the relative mole ratio of my different components, and I know what my components are because I have a mass spec. Um, but you do need something, if you just took a mixture and put it into a mass spec or an IR, you're just going to get a mess because you're going to get signals from both compounds, um, which, and you can't really tell which signal goes with which compound. Say, okay, if I have two compounds, I know that one of them is an alcohol, but I don't know which one and whether the one that's the alcohol goes with this carbonyl peak or if that's the other compounds. So we have to separate them before we can get much information on what they are. Um, what mechanism have I noticed is most difficult to understand? A lot of times we'll, we'll see that some mechanisms kind of We'll have a general set of rules for mechanisms, and then, but then someone said, "Well, but this compound doesn't behave that way. But boron doesn't need to have a full valence to be to be relatively stable and neutral." So, so a lot of times the mechanisms that that break our general rules tend to be the hardest, maybe not the hardest to understand, but the hardest to remember, especially in a test situation, right? Because you, on a test situation, you're trying to assume everything's going to follow the usual rules. Um, with that said, the most difficult to keep up with and to understand is probably when we start doing free radical mechanisms, because up to this point, even if it's something weird like boron um, or a metal, we've been dealing with pairs of electrons. Everything is in pairs. Free radical mechanisms, um, rules for stability are weird, and you're only dealing with one electron at a time moving or one electron from one molecule meets one electron from another molecule to make a bond instead of moving a whole pair of electrons to make or break a bond, um, which is, takes a little getting used to. But that said, we'll have a full chapter on free radical mechanisms and they do tend to follow a really predictable pattern, even if it's not the pattern we're used to. So we'll, we'll take our time as we get there, um, but that's what I've seen from my students in general, seems to be that the free radical mechanisms are the trickiest, which is a little different than when I learned it, because I, as I recall, when I first learned this, we learned free radical mechanisms before any other mechanisms. So I didn't have that background of everything is a pair of electrons yet, um, which had its ups and downs, learning it that way too. And last but not least, um, if you're looking for information on tutoring. Um, Cody is still our go-to chemistry tutor, Cody Simmons, um, who's taken all of the uh, OCHEM classes. Is it on Cranium Cafe? Is that what I'm looking for? Um, and all of everybody's hours are available on this Cranium Cafe link, um, which you do, it will make you sign in if you're not signed in when you click on this link. This is just the, the um, LTCC library page and then click on tutoring. You can get to that link. Um, and from here, where am I missing? Where's, there it is, bottom right. Um, and this is everybody. And then you can you can get help online if you're not local, but if they say online here, then that means they're also at the library right now as well, for the most part. Um, and there's a few good resources. When I say resources, I mean people. Um, oh, there's, so 
some of them. Uh, David is a good, I recommend him for chemistry, but he hasn't taken OCHEM yet. So he's not really all that helpful for OCHEM tutoring. Um, I don't know. I met this guy the other day. He actually has a math degree and, and is in a grad school program with a minor in chemistry. So he's taken OCHEM, but it might have been a long time ago. I don't know how strong he is on OCHEM, just like with anything else. There are people, chemists that are good at OCHEM, and there's chemists that are good at other parts of chemistry. Um, but if you see Ollie around, um, you could ask him how he feels about OCHEM. He might be able to help you. Um, but the two that I would go to for sure, I'm missing. Did you scroll right by him? Oh, there he was. He was on the other side when I looked at it first. So Cody's hours are Monday, Wednesday, 10 to 2 in the library. Um, and where's Brad Peden? Brad Peden um, is listed as a math tutor, but he's taken the first two quarters of OCHEM. I don't think he finished OCHEM 3. Um, but if you know Brad, he's a big guy, usually has a Raiders hat on. Um, and he's he's around most mornings, um, including on Fridays. I seem to see him a lot. Um, but he could, he, like I said, I, he might not remember it. He's not officially a chemistry tutor, so he might not want or want the responsibility of helping you with OCHEM since this is the last class he completed. Um, but you, if he's around, you could ask him and he might be able to point you the right direction. At least. Um, but Cody's our go-to for sure. Um, oh, and uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what their hours are, but I believe Ty is still on the list. Uh, Bel Air's. Um, and yeah, they're listed as as a chemistry tutor. Um, I don't think I usually see them these hours necessarily. So these might not be the most current hours. Um, but if you ask in the library, they'll be able to, to tell you as well. Um, and they completed OCHEM 3 last year. Um, and so sh should be able to at least help you work through some of this stuff. Um, I mean, we're getting second year club courses are the point where even our tutors are not necessarily I'm going to feel that strong about it. It's not like getting, you know, algebra help from someone who's taken Calc 3 um, is a little bit different than someone who passed this last year but doesn't remember that much of it necessarily. Um, especially now that we don't have Rigney around. Rigney was the type of tutor who would, whose idea of a good time on a Friday night was to, was to put on a record and study chemistry. Um, that he... He outdid me on a lot of things um, when it came to OCAM. So, but with Rigney not around, Cody's Cody's approaching that level of uh, of knowledge when it comes to OCAM as well. And there are a few other people that you could at least ask. <clears throat> All right, how did the how did the quiz go? I didn't look at answers yet because I just wanted to check everybody's questions first. And this is really just a good review figure, right? This is everything we've learned. I blacked out, whited out that top one because we didn't get that last reaction yet, which is called oxidative cleavage. So that's the new one we're going to add today. Um, but the rest of these, it's mostly, okay, is it Markovnikov? Is it anti-Markovnikov? How do we... How do we go about doing that? And actually, I probably should have blacked out the top right one as well, because I don't think we did anti Markov. We thought hydrobromination, didn't we? So we'll throw that one up on. Let me pull up the, the textbook. Um, so, what happens when I change the order of the slides on the fly is sometimes my quiz questions are a little bit out of order. Make sure. Um, 
Yeah, there it is. So reaction two as listed here, the, one of the reasons we didn't go through the mechanism for this in detail is because this is a free radical mechanism. It's got that peroxide in it. But basically if you put a peroxide and HBr with um, with an alkene, instead of just getting the Markovnikov bromine, hydrobromination, you get the anti-Markovnikov hydrobromination. And and would that work with the regular like, hydrogen peroxide or hydrogen peroxide would work um and we'll look at the this is another one where where we don't necessarily um know the complete we know it has to do with um that it's a radical mechanism but this is actually one of the reasons that markovnikov's rule took a long time to get published is because they wound up finding um, they re they sourced more hydrobromic acid for him to do more studies in you know the eighteen hundreds in Russia, and where they sourced it from had some peroxide contamination in the bottle, and so all of a sudden he the Markovnikov's rule wasn't Markovnikov it. Um, he was getting the opposite. And he, and he couldn't figure out why. And eventually they figured out that if they switched which bottle they were using out of the stock room, they would switch which product they got because one of the bottles had a little bit of peroxide in it. Just trace amounts was all it took. Um, so we're not going to go through the mechanism for that one, but that's our tool now that we know that and can control that. That's a good tool for, for doing an anti-Markovnikov hydrobromination is to do it in the presence of, of peroxide. Um, and I believe, yeah, it's not till when we get to talking about free radical reactions, we'll go into that re mechanism in more detail. But at this point, we're going to stick to our regular reaction rules. Um, and I had just forgotten that I grabbed that from, again, the other textbook stuff's just presented in just different enough of an order that it that uh, sometimes I don't catch it when I do that. So apologies. Um, but for the rest of these, so anti Markovnikov hydration, that's our hyperboration, right? So BH3 um, in, in a polar aprotic solvent, followed by what's our um, oxidation step? So peroxide and OH, right? Yeah. Um, so two steps. And when it when it comes to writing this out and answering this question, um, in, I'm not going to be that picky about whether or not you remember to write the THF part. Um, partly because I'm more of a theoretical chemist than an experimental chemist, so the reaction details don't matter as much to me. Um, and so I tend to forget them sometimes. But so write it like that or just BH3 for step one. And then NaOH H2O2. Or was it the prop was it that one or was it the peroxy acetic acid? Thank you. Okay. The peroxy acetic acid was for the one was for the one after that was for making the epoxides. All right. So dihydroxylation, we have two different mechanisms. We could either do the peroxide formation and then the ring opening, um, or we can use the osmium osmium eight oxide OS four um, as the as the reagent for that. If we want to add a bromine and an oxygen next to each other, that's our halo hydrogen. It's like our dibromination, except we break it up halfway through. We use OH as our nucleophile. file. That happens if you have water present. If that happens naturally if you have water present when you're doing it. You can also favor that if you want to make this product over the dibromo product um, by, by con controlling the concentrations. 
higher concentration of, of hydroxide as a nucleophile, lower concentration of bromine. It's going to slow your reaction down, but once you make that bromonium three-sided ring, um, there's a much greater chance that you wind up with um, with the uh, OA jacking as the nucleophile than the bromide. And there were two choices here, right? Either go that's the um, oxymercuration, demercuration, or you can go with just the acid catalyzed hydration. Either would work. This is just HBr, right? HBr with no peroxide. Get some Markovnikov bromide. You can then put through a. If we wanted to, we could put that through a an elimination reaction, which effectively just moves your your pi bond, right? And we're going to wind up seeing that that is a really this is a really useful tool as well, because it might take several steps in a row. But that allows us to kind of put a functional group. Oh, you want to do a dihydroxylation, but you don't want it on those two, so you move your pi bond first, and then you do your dihydroxylation. Um, and you can do, if you're careful about how you do it and the, the structure favors it, you can even do this multiple times in a row to get the, the um, pipeline to move more than one part away from where it started. Um, because now if we did an anti markovnikov hydration, we're putting an OH here instead of there. So it gives us a lot of tools. To be able to just move the pi bond and then have all the same tools available to us. Here's our osmium tetroxide, gives us the zin addition. If we want it to be anti addition, then we make the epoxide first. So that was our, our um, per carboxylic acid. So a CO3H group makes the peroxide, and then you can expose it to water to get the anti addition. And if we just wanted to hydrogenate, hydrogen and platinum. So that was a very quick recap of like three lectures worth of material, but it does sort of all build on itself. So um, hopefully that was a, a decent review. Let's do our last reaction for um, for this chapter. Um, and this is this is another just like the Grignard reagent was was basically our only tool for adding carbons to our, our parent molecule. Um, oxidative cleavage is going to be one of there's only a few tools that we really see um, where we can remove carbons. From our, from our parent molecule. Um, and this will even get more useful once we, once we cover a chapter on carbonyl groups because we have a bunch of reactions we can, we can use um, with carbonyls. We can you know, continue going down this pathway and make even more products. Um, we just don't have any, any reactions that have anything to do with carbonyl groups yet. So this is sort of a not all that useful yet, but it is our only way we have of chopping up a molecule into smaller pieces. <clears throat> um, and so the, the technical name is oxidative cleavage. Cleavage just meaning you cleave something to chop it up. Um, and oxidative meaning you're oxidizing things. So effectively what this does, I always learned ozonolysis because this molecule here, the common name for it is ozone. And so if you have ozone and you expose it to, to double bond, it effectively will just chop the, the net result is it chops the double bond in half. We put an oxygen on each side. All right, we'll go with the what the mechanism is for that first. And then the second step is because um, if you just expose it to the ozone, you get a molecule called an ozonide. 
where you wind up with three oxygens attached and you put it sort of this weird oxygen ring structure where the alkene was. You have to take that and expose it to dimethyl, uh, DMS in this case is dimethyl sulfanamide. Might just be dimethyl sulfide. Um, but when you do that, it basically breaks up that, that ozonide ring structure and you're just left with the carbon oxygen pipelines. Right, and this is one where it's it's a just a two-step mechanism. But it's a weird one because you've got a whole bunch of arrows going all over the place at first. Again. So similar to making that peroxide. Uh, or that epoxide, where you bring ozone in, and ozone has this Lewis soft structure, which looks weird, but if you look at all the formal charges, they all add up to zero. Um, and when you bring ozone in, it'll go through, it'll move three pairs of electrons. You move pi electrons towards you know, one of your oxygens. The oxygen-oxygen pi bond moves over to the middle oxygen, and then one of the oxygen lone pairs on the oxygen that's drawn with a, with a negative charge um, forms a bond. And so you wind up with this five-sided ring structure where three of those, those vertices are oxygens instead of carbon. So it's not a cyclopentyl. It's what they call a molozonide. And ozonide in general just means that you've got ozone attached itself to something with five electrons. And once you do that, you can do another little shuffle um, to make something more stable ozonide that looks like this. So basically, you make your, your products, the ones that you would get if you chop this right down the middle, form, but you still have one extra oxygen, so they wind up reattaching um, with the oxygen, with one of the oxygens in between the carbons that you're breaking up. And then there's two oxygens in between on the other side. So less oxygen to oxygen bonds. Less oxygen to oxygen bond makes it more stable, exactly. It's still not that stable, so you do still have a peroxide bond. Um, and so when you take that ozonide and expose it to Pretty much any reducing agent, you don't want it to be a super strong reducing agent because then you start getting your products continue to react um, and be reduced further. But your a mild reducing agent, um, such as zinc metal or DMS, which I think it is dimethyl sulfanamide, but either way, in this context, it just means you're going to take that ozonide and it just breaks up. One of the oxygen goes to oxidizing your reducing agent, and two of the oxygens stick around attached to your, to your carbon pieces. This is probably also one of the trickier mechanisms to understand because very rarely do we see carbon-carbon sigma bonds breaking especially just to make another intermediate, right? So this second step here, that's a weird step to us. We don't see that in very many of our other mechanisms, right? Um, but that's what makes the whole process work, is the fact that we do this rearrangement, and the part of the, the second piece of this rearrangement is breaking that carbon-carbon pipeline. And so now we have two separate parent molecules from each other. What was one big carbon based molecule, now two carbon based molecules. This is for the two molecules, but they like all other products like rearranged. I mean, there's going to be some, some amount of, of randomness to it, especially if we have a, a molecule that's a little more complicated than this. Like, if you try to do this with alkene or with uh, aromatics, it doesn't necessarily work like this. I don't think that you can put a benzene ring through ozonolysis and get, it'll react, but you won't get predictable products. You'll get kind of a mess of randomness. Um, 
if it's just an alkene with no resonance, it's pretty predictable. Is really when you start bringing in resonance into the picture that things get weird. Um, but this is actually, if you've ever heard of ozone treating water to, to do um, wastewater treatment, basically anytime you have water that can, that could have living organisms in it, living organisms depend on alkene bonds, right? Because those phospholipid bilayers are full of alkenes. So if you take something that has living organisms in it and you expose it to ozone, then you basically just destroy all the cell membranes and you kill everything in there. It still might not be safe to drink yet because it still has all those organic molecules present, but at least it's not something that's actively multiplying. So you could sterilize it this way. And then um, there are other ways, other steps that you can do to actually remove those organic molecules from the water. But ozonolysis is really common for the first step for treating um, surface water or wastewater. Um, especially since ozone is actually pretty easy to generate if you have oxygen gas. So you don't actually have to have a tank full of ozone. You have a tank full of oxygen that you pass through a pipe that has a certain voltage applied to both sides. You make ozone and then that can wind up um, sterilizing things. I want to say that this is that's partly it's similar to how they do the saltwater um, swimming pools. They don't, it's not really that the salt water sterilizes the water. It's that the salt water is, is then taken out of circulation and put into a tank with a certain voltage to it that makes it something really nasty and unstable um, that kills everything in there. And, but it's really short lived. So then when you pump the water back into the pool, all the organisms are dead. Um, I think that's, that is, still generating chlorine in that case, not ozone, but there are some uh, hot tub purification systems that use ozone instead. All right, so with that in mind, what do we do to get from here to there? It doesn't look like we changed the carbon structure much, but we did, right? We chopped one carbon off. So anytime you're removing a carbon for something you're from, from the molecule, your first thought should be ozonolysis. What would we get as product if we took this molecule and put it through ozonolysis? Yeah, and it can be a little bit tricky to, to visualize. So it can help to draw the molecule out again, just the same way it is, um, except sort of like offset those two bonds a little bit. So we expose it to O3, then BMS. So in this case, it makes it a little bit trickier in that we wind up breaking a bond, we, but we still get all one molecule left, but we broke the break part. So we get something that looks like this, which isn't the way we normally want to draw in, but for the sake of drawing, keeping all the carbons physically in the same spot, and then just redrawing that pi bond as two carbonyls be helpful to draw it like this first. And then you can say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Draw it in our more standard skeletal structure where we can just put it something that looks more, more predictable. Because this is that molecule, right? Same thing.
it's small side note. Normally we get two products out of this process, right? Um, so in this case, you got two new functional groups that are also part of the same molecule. What happens to the other carbon you chopped off the first one? Going to get cyclopentanone. That other carbon, we would normally expect it based on, on the normal rules. We, okay, we get a carbonyl on a single carbon by itself. Which is formaldehyde. The problem is formaldehyde is really not very stable on its own. And if it's if it's in a situation where there's still more oxygen around, um, Usually, if you wind up doing one of these reactions where you make a single carbon fragment in an oxidative environment, this is going to ox continue to oxidize. And so basically, um, the other piece of this molecule will go through a couple of, of more oxidation steps and you'll just get CO2. CO2 is so much more stable than a single carbon with an oxygen attached to it um, that it winds up just oxidizing itself the rest of the way. We don't really show that mechanism or even as that product because that's not even really an organic product anymore. Um, so it's just sort of a, a byproduct. Mm. Uh, can you get more than two? products or is it just especially if you have more than two pi bonds in your molecule we looked at lemonine this is why this is so effective at um at treating wastewater is because pretty much everything has some pi bonds but if you have something like lemonine It's got two places it can be attached. You need two stoichiometric equivalents. You need two moles of, of ozone for every one mole of limonene. But you're gonna get a, you're gonna get several. Actually, this is still because it's still gonna it's still gonna be only one product, but it's gonna be chopped in both places. You can't pick preferentially. This is kind of this is a little bit of a bull in the china shop sort of mechanism where something's going to happen if you expose it it's not necessarily it's going to go for this one first and then for that one where you're like oh if i just do one mole of, of ozone do one mole of ozone half the time it's going to go there half the time it's going to go there except maybe one percent of the time it does both of those and you wind up with some unreacted stuff it's just going to all have what we call a statistical mixture so it's not healthy it's not really like measure. exactly so that's why we typically just do complete ozonolysis so that we say, okay, well, I don't know what order it's going to happen in, but I know I'm going to break that one and I'm going to break that one. All right. Let's take a break. In fact, let's... This is going to be the first part of your, let me make sure that I didn't do anything silly with the reactions again. Um, let's take a break for 10 minutes, and then we're going to start working on, on some reactions practice that'll be part of the assignment for, for this week's lab. Um, and in fact, if you give me, if you give me twenty minutes, I can have that assignment finished up. Um, I'm gonna and just why why don't you in twenty minutes come by my office? I'll head over to my office so I can print print you out copies of it as well.
Um, and then that's what we'll do for the rest of the lecture in the beginning part of the lab, is just work on, on a paper assignment. But give me a few minutes to put it together. Okay? So quarter after or any time between, between now and, and noon, um, come by my office and you pick up the assignment. Okay?